For everyone lost in the endlessly multiplicating realities of the modern world, remember, Philip K. Dick got there first. This quote from Terry Gilliam is printed to every other paperback I own, so let's prove him right. It's November of 2019. It's ideal seems that when a well-known sci-fi story takes place. Writers of Futurama were huge fans of Dick's work. This they admit. In fact, when the show started, Matt Groening named its main influences to be Robert Heinlein, Philip K. Dick, Cord Werner Smith, Theodore Sturgeon and Robert Checkley. Even if it often feels like there was more of Stanislav Lem than any of those five. But let's not let our attention to wander. We will concentrate to Dick. Such a man! I'd follow him to hell and back I would! Many of the late writers' stories and ideas are sprinkled throughout the series. But if you want to find all of them, you need to build an unhealthy obsession to drag yourself through everything PKD ever produced. And even that might not be enough. More of that later. But here is every Philip K. Dick reference in Futurama that I could find. Right, spoilers for basically every story in the history of stories. Starting from season 1, episode 6, A Fish Full of Dollars. This is the episode where Fry becomes a billionaire and uses his excessive wealth to keep on living like it's still the 20th century. Now he can hunt for the greatest treasure he can imagine. Seven. Anchovies? The last known can in existence, do I hear $10,000? 15000 300000 500 Oh, mercy me. A million. Two. Six. Fourteen. But all this begins when Fry gets annoyed by advertisement inserted into his dreams. Lightspeed fits today's active lifestyle, whether you're on the job or having fun. Lightspeed Brief. Published in 1954, Sales Pitch was a short story by Dick where a man wants to escape from the solar system because ads are everywhere, including his retinas, during his dreams. Throughout the story he keeps, keeps on fighting a robot that's trying to sell itself to him. It was later adapted to Crazy Diamond in Philip K. Dick's Electric Dreams, but no one remembers that including me. Simple enough. To episode 7, my three sons. Fry becomes the emperor of planet Trisol by accidentally drinking the previous one. However, the rain is short as they find out that the emperors last on average a week. Every emperor is eventually assassinated and the assassin inherits the crown. Have any idea what the average length of their reigns was? One week. Well, at least my assassin will get what's coming to him. Solar Lottery was published in 1955, being the first science fiction novel from Dick. And the first one to see the light of day, as his earlier novels were non-sci-fi and rejected by the publishers. In this world, the Quizmaster, that's basically Emperor, is chosen in a lottery system, so no one has an advantage over any other of becoming the next head of the solar system. The Quizmaster then stays in power by surviving assassination attempts that are televised. Those reigns last from somewhere between few years to mere minutes. So here Futurama took the idea that was based in a world of logic, game theory and numbers and asked what if the same thing was done but for stupid reasons. <laughs> Well, Fry manages to cry out the Emperor and Trisol is forgotten. Unless they came back in the Three Body Trilogy, which has nothing to do with this. Quit it. Episode 8. Yes, three consecutive episodes during the first season were constructed at least a little from Dick's ideas. Here, Earth is threatened by ancient waste. New Yorkers of the past didn't know what to do with it, so they sent it to space. Now it's coming back and threatens lives of billions. Only solution comes from Fry. 
let's create another pile of trash to bounce the old trash to the sun. This solution can only come from him as the 30th century New York has been trash free for hundreds of years. So he has to teach them how to create it. The slurm can? Now it's garbage. These papers? Garbage. The variable man was a novella where a time traveler from 1910s helps humans from the far future to survive against an alien invasion. He's a sort of genius by being a basic do-it-yourself guy who can use a hammer and a wrench. The new humanity are so specialized to their own specific tasks that no one else has the ability to invent things. People of this future can't fix things. They just throw away everything that breaks. The variable man eventually manages to break the blockage around the solar system and humanity is now free to roam the galaxy. In Futurama, the end result is just as grandiose. What if the second garbage ball returns to Earth like the first one did? Well, who cares? That won't be for hundreds of years. Exactly! It's none of our concern. So Futurama needed someone dumber than anyone else. In the original story, he's called the Variable Man because his brain works so differently from anyone else's that his actions cannot be calculated in advance. Unlike the highly specialized future folk whose brain works in streamlined ways that can be predicted by the enemy. This might also have been the reason why Fry remained unaffected later on during the episode when the Earth stood stupid. So that was season one, I think. Pretty straightforward thus far. Well, this was the time when the series was still establishing itself. Nothing too crazy out there. I could mention Mars University, but I'm just going to dive into Mars when I reach where the bugalo roam. As mentioned in the first quote, Dick developed many concepts that became household tropes in science fiction, then it's difficult to say who really was parodied. Room for interpretation is plentiful. Are Nibelonians standing for the adjustment team? I don't know. Is New New York a name taken from a Philip K. Dick story? Can't really say. Is something borrowed from Simulacra, 1964? I don't know. That novel introduced a season worth of concepts while having no time to explore any of them. Is the concept of I dated a robot taken from Blade Runner? Maybe. So for now, the season two, where chronology gets slightly confusing and I might stop following the order of seasons altogether. War is the H word spends most of its runtime being starship troopers. It's a desolate, ugly little planet with absolutely no natural resources or strategic value. Who's the enemy? A valid question. We know nothing about their language, their history or what they look like. Then Nixon decides to end the war by transforming Bender into Imposter. Imposter was an early story of Dick that was later adapted to a movie starring Gary Sinise that was seen by no one. Our protagonist Spence Olham is chased by his government for being a sleeper agent. According to the government, this isn't the real Spence, but a replica that replaced the true one after killing him and has inside him a bomb powerful enough to destroy a planet. A bomb that will detonate when he says an unknown trigger word. Trying to clear his name, he searches and finds the wreckage of the alien ship, but also inside it a dead Olham. He then realizes he truly was the alien robot and utters the trigger word. If that's Olham. This causes the bomb to detonate. The explosion is so massive, it's seen all the way at Alpha Centauri. Bender is sent to negotiate peace with Earth's enemies, while not knowing there's a bomb inside him. That will go off if he utters the word. And Bender's number one most frequently uttered word, the word which, if uttered, will blow up this entire planet, ass. <gasps> We don't have long! Everything works out fine eventually. We couldn't disarm the bomb, so we reset the word that triggers it. And peeking? Luck of the Fraish. Sounds as good as time as any to discuss the name. This is the episode Fry finds out his brother became the first man on Mars. 
Fry gets annoyed that his brother stole his seven-leaf clover and his first name, Philip, to achieve this. While grave robbing, he finds out that his brother named his first son after his lost brother. I'm naming you Philip J. Fry in honor of my little brother, who I miss every day. Philip J. Fry's first name comes from Philip K. Dick. This is very much confirmed by the writers. And among everything I'm listing here, it's the only thing that's established and agreed. Rest will be my rambling theories like Charlie hosting Philadelphian Infowars. Maybe Lur is ancient Sumerian for he who in real life wrote psychological warfare. Citation needed. <laughs> Martian time slip spills a lot to Mars of Futurama. The Martians, or the bleak men as they are referred, are like African Bushman tribe. Pretty obsessed and forgotten. In Futurama, the continent has changed, but otherwise it's the same. Earthman that has made most money of Martian land is called Leo. Really. And humans have tamed the local fauna of giant insectoids. In Martian time slip, they are something like giant praying mantises. In Dick's Martian school, robots do all the teaching. So it only makes sense that in Futurama, it's the humans who teach robots, in a way that makes as little sense as possible. You went to college? Of course, I'm a bender. I went to bending college. I majored in bending. What was your minor? Robo-American studies. In both versions, Martians appear as simpletons at first, but are in fact surprisingly fluent in precognition. But I thought your people abandoned this planet. We did. I just came back for my stuff. What are you guys doing here? Fleeing Earth, of course. We flew here in your great stone pyramid. Your people left it so we could escape. I translated your warning that the world was doomed. Not your world. Our world. We put Calendar there to warn you not to visit Mars. It Mars that gonna be destroyed. <gasps> In time sleep, someone even might have bought the land from the Martians by giving them just stones. But I don't remember. Insane in the mainframe is an episode where Fry and Bender are sent to Robot Asylum. And of course, there's a Lincoln robot. We can build you was a PKD novel where robot-human relationships were discussed before Do Android's Dream of Electric Sheep. Louis Rosen builds a simulacra of Lincoln, creating its mind by collecting everything Lincoln ever said and wrote. Like that Black Mirror episode where a mourning widow brings back Dom Hal Gleason. The novel was originally called Lincoln Simulacrum. Eventually, Rosen is the one who goes insane and spends later half of the book in asylum. Lincoln Android becomes a lawyer and functions just like any other member of society. Fry's and Bender's fates mirror this plot. So when Fry and Bender go to Robot Asylum, I had only one thought. I can bet my mom there's a Lincoln robot somewhere in this episode. Problem is, he's got multiple personalities. All of them Lincoln. I was born in 200 log cabins. Just like Rosen creates Lincoln by collecting data from old speeches and writings, Farnsworth has to do the same to build Fry and Leela in Rebirth. When Planet Express ship crashes after escaping the fourth movie, most of the crew can be remade even if only their heads have survived the blast. But there's nothing left of Fry. Leela was so distraught, she went all Blade Runner and built a duplicate. Then uploaded Fry's personality from the urinal surveillance tapes. I sure love Leela. After a functional replicant of Fry is built, soon there's nothing left of Leela. Again, the semi-consensual invasion of privacy solves the problem. F Come now, Fry. You can't live out this sick fantasy. Not without our help. These security tapes record everything at Planet Express, including the ship, 
Shower and urinals. Analyze tapes and extract personality profile of one Taranga Leela. Analyzing. Analyzing. Checking my eBay bid. Damn it. Analysis complete. Robo Fry and Robo Leela realize they are not the original ones. Discovering you're a robot is a crisis much pondered in a PKD story. Story called The Electric Ant. Which is so crazy that I still think the writers wanted to expand it into a full episode. Had there been more seasons, that episode would definitely exist. Just like the episode about the clans of the Alphane Moon. Let's talk about Ubik. One of Dick's most beloved novels begins with establishing a world where the dead don't just die, but are put in a half-life. A virtual reality from which they can be awakened for finite times to have discussions with the relatives who pay for the upkeep. Those in half-life eventually begin to control the virtual world they inhabit. This idea was also used in San Junipero the Black Mirror episode that really didn't feel like a Black Mirror episode, because in it everything ended up fine. This is the, just the start of it. In A Clone of My Own, Professor Farnsworth is taken to the Near Death Star after his 160th birthday. After the crew rescues him, he tells them what the half-life of Ubik would truly be for a bunch of senile old farts. So what were they doing to you in that awful drawer? Oh, they had me hooked up to a bizarre virtual world that seemed absolutely real. What was it like? It was as though I were living in a facility in Florida with hundreds of other old people. All day long we'd play bingo, eat oatmeal, and wait for our children to call. Ugh, oh. It's a hundred times more horrible than anything I could imagine. Yes, horrible as we would later witness in Near Death Wish, where Farnsworth's parents are seen living in this exact half-life. In Ubik, those in half-life aren't always in complete control over their worlds. A kid named Jori, who's in half-life 2, intrudes to other half-lives and messes them up in order of consuming their poor souls. When even he can't keep the worlds together, time starts to slip. Our hero, Joe Chip, who in this moment doesn't yet know he's in Half-Life, might jump in a plane built in 2000 and jump away from it in 1950s, if there's a plane left. Time keeps slipping, takes this concept and runs the other way. While Joe Chip's reality eventually anchors to 1939, in Futurama time starts to jump farther and farther ahead because the space is rippled when Farnsworth wanted to remake Space Jam, but good. Behold, my invincible nuclear mutants! There is a reason why Joe spends a while in his half-life without really knowing it. He thinks he's been in an explosion that killed his boss, but left all others unharmed. But it's the other way around. His boss, Rancifer, is the only one who survives. That's the twist that Joe found out in the last act. Ubik is a spray inside the half-life that keeps you from deteriorating and protects from the consuming preteen. In the end, Joe eventually learns to control his virtual environment. In The Sting, Fry gets killed by a space bee. Leela mourns this and begins to lose her grip on reality. Only thing that keeps her from completely losing her sanity, amongst the guilt of being the reason for Fry's demise, as Fry was killed protecting her, is the mysterious space honey. Mmm, it's good. I feel funny. Ha <laughs> funny. <laughs> Eventually, Leela wakes up from a coma she was in. It wasn't Fry who died, it was she who almost died, spending her time in a very similar half-life, only hearing Fry's cries through her deep sleep. 
The stinger went right through me and you got all the poison. My new spleen came from a guy who liked the motorcycle. Yubi comes back for just a throwaway line in Farnsworth Paradox. Our universe is doomed! Doomed! Now don't give up yet, you crybabies. The box is gone, but we still have one preposterously slim hope. Is it a kind of hairspray? No! A reasonable reaction from Farnsworth since, according to Dick, Yubik was basically a stand-in for God. Yubik is a story that was made for Futurama-like spoof. No wonder they came back to it so often. Keeping with the subject of time going backwards, Teenage Mutant Leela Hurdles. In this episode, the crew gets covered in a goo that de-ages them. As Leela tries to live her teenage years, they discover they are getting younger every moment. This eventually gets solved in the Fountain of Aging. Counter Clock World is one of Dick's weirder novels, that meaning that I don't know why it exists. He expanded his short story Your Appointment Will Be Yesterday to a full novel where time has started going backwards in 1986. Maybe the world realized that the best movie year had passed, so the humanity must have peaked. So... Anyway, the dead are dug from graves when they wake up. Technological innovations get uninvented. People de-age until becoming infants. They then have to be pushed back into mothers who nine months later need to have sex with a man who sucks away the seeds. Miss Leela, I have a question. Yes, Albert? That story was bad. It's a pretty unique situation when kids are pretty much worthless, since they're gonna die soon anyway, and 90-year-olds are much more valuable. It still makes even less sense than that Benjamin Button story. This seems like a reach, I admit, but there was another minor scene in the novel. It involved a drug that made everything else slow down except the user. Not in that dread kind of way, but like Quicksilver in new X-Men movies. In Counter Clock World, this drug is used in, let's call it, an action scene. So my guess is that Fry ingesting 100 coffees in 300 big boys and clearing the burning building was inspired by this novel. Let's return to something more familiar, to something less far-fetched. In Obsoletely Fabulous, Bender needs an upgrade so he can tolerate a new robot that seems to replace him in Planet Express. Death to the One X robots! During the upgrade, he changes his mind and escapes. Hilarity ensues as he tries to destroy all technology on Earth until said 1X robot stops him from burning down everything. Ah, save my friends! Ah, and join back! We were totally in sync. I was like, save them! And he was all, no problem! And then he did it! This new technology is great! I love those magnificent 1X robots! Your upgrade is complete. Everyone experiences the upgrade differently. This is pretty self-explanatory. When Total Recall ended, the story we didn't see might well have been Arnold waking up from his dream as a secret agent on Mars and going back to his wife. In the original story, we can remember it for you wholesale, Quaid never gets to Mars. It's a pretty half-assed short story. Only reason we remember it is the far superior film adaptation that took the premise and just ran with it and did whatever it wanted. Another novel from Dick that was pretty much made for Futurama is the penultimate truth. In the future, most people live underground because the war is going on on the surface. This is really a lie. War has ended long ago and the rich elite rules the surface while forcing the underground masses to work for the war effort. They are lied to by news anchors that are really just simulated holograms. On the surface, many are feeling guilt for their privilege, 
but can't do too much as there also sits a tyrant above all, Bros, who controls the war robots. Bros wants to claim a piece of land by sending fake alien artifacts to the past. This involves legalities too complicated to explain here. Time travel oddities give a Cherokee from the distant past a crazy long lifespan. He knows that Bros will create more havoc in the future if not terminated. So a plot to assassinate the tyrant begins. In the end, underground people wait for the fake newscaster to appear, but it doesn't, proving that Bros's assassination was successful. There's a lot more and you should just read it. When the phrase, my fellow Americans, is uttered in the penultimate truth, it could only make me think of my fellow Earthicans. Well, the opposite happens in Decision 3012, where a man travels from the future to win the election so Nixon wouldn't build a space wall and make poor people into soil and green. It ends in a scene that pretty much kept the penultimate truth from ever being adapted to a film. People watching a man just not being there anymore. You see, since Nixon wasn't elected, the robot uprising didn't happen, and Travers never got sent back from the future. It's Politics 101. And the votes are in. Richard Nixon, running unopposed, has been re-elected by a narrow landslide. So evil prevails. This is all easy to miss because the time traveling plot is presented in a way where the robot uprising is pretty much the same as that other movie that everyone remembers. All right, I'm low on boards. Everybody scooch together. I think I might get sidetracked and could lose you. So let's get to something where there's no room for interpretation. Lethal Inspection is the episode where Bender finds out he has no backup unit. So if his body gets destroyed, he can't just download his mind to a new body. This makes him mortal. You were built without a backup unit. So, if I die, you die. Or as you put it, He wants to avenge this to Inspector 5, who let him leave the assembly with this defect. Bender and Hermes begin their search for Inspector 5. They are soon chased by mom's robots, since mom doesn't want a flawed product to tarnish her name. Because I have a complaint about a defective robot. His name is me. A defective robot, you say? <coughs> Stay right there, dearie. I'll have tech support take care of you. Hermes fakes Bender's death, and Bender comes to terms with not living forever. A secret Hermes kept from Bender is that he was the mysterious Inspector 5. This episode is what the expert refer as a sneaky bugger, because it really keeps us from seeing the forest from the trees. Let's go through that plot again, but without the names. A sentient, human-like robot wants to live longer. I want more life, father. So he contacts the biggest player in robot building industry. Now he's chased by somewhat incompetent robot exterminators simply for existing. In the end, he must come to terms with his mortality, while forgiving the one responsible for his misery. Yes, it is the plot of Blade Runner, and I couldn't find anything from the internet to back up this claim that seems so obvious now. In fact, it was maybe my fourth watch when I realized this. And the episode begins by making us think of Blade Runner. The candle that burns twice as bright burns half as long. The light that burns twice as bright burns half as long. And you have burned so very, very brightly, Roy. Yes, they reference the movie during the first minute when they reenact a war that we never get a clear picture of, but when a huge amount of people apparently died, like World War Terminus. There are other references to Blade Runner. That candle is seen in Bender's game, and Turtle on its back also appears. The tortoise lays on its back, its belly baking in the hot sun, beating its legs, trying to turn itself over, but it can't. Some also believe that the owls are everywhere, because in Dick's original story, 
owls were the first thing to go extinct. So in Futurama it's the opposite. So they are everywhere, like rats. I have another theory. When Dick passed away, he had started a book titled The Owl in Daylight. No one knows the plot. There are only speculations. Here it makes so much sense thematically. Seldom noticed, but always present. Much like PKD's whole legacy in the 31st century. Owl exterminators. We're owl exterminators. Let's talk about the movies. Bender's big score borrows a lot from the penultimate truth. By that, I don't mean there are literal referencing, but you can see the influences. These skin flaps manage to claim ownership to Planet Express with spam. You got spam! Spam, spam, junk. Oh, the very last pygmy rhino is going extinct? Unless it gets my credit card number? Spam, spam. Hi, how are you? Oh, that must be from Kiffy. Hi, how are you? Low, low prices on erectile dis... I've won the Spanish National Lottery. I just need to wire some collateral to collect the winnings. Hi, we own your company now. So, you know, manipulate the masses with something that doesn't really exist. Like the fake news anchor. They brainwash Bender to travel back in time to steal anything they please. Bender then just waits until he brings the treasures back centuries later. So they claim ownership to Earth's valuables by sending stuff Bender back in time. Here Bender is the one whose crazy long lifespan allows him to stay alive through the millennia. The skin flaps eventually claim the whole Earth, and all the Earthicans are forced to exile. This time to Neptune instead of underground. My fellow Earthicans, I've just received some really great news. I'm about to close a deal that will allow us to buy Earth back from the scammers. Yeah! I received an email from the Andromeda Galaxy. It seems we've won their quadrillion dollar family sweeps. Some kind. Of <laughs> we've been scammed again, people. Prepare to evacuate Earth. When all this gets settled, a group of benders manage to disturb space time to create a crack in space. So the following movie does borrow some elements from a novel by Dick. Yeah, that one. While otherwise being a disjointed retelling of Theodore Sturgeon's To Marry a Medusa or The Cosmic Rape. But I'm not here to discuss Sturgeon, so let's go to Bender's game. Eye in the Sky is a Dick's novel that, much like Ubik or The Penultimate Truth, made for Futurama. In it, a small group of people are transported into each other's minds by a space beam. They can't escape, and said individuals aren't the most balanced ones. I don't think I need to say anything about the novel. It's pretty much exactly what our heroes have to go through when they get trapped into Bender's mind. Now corrupted by Dungeons and Dragons. When Bender's game aired, everyone only remembered Aragorn and Jeremy Irons. That's why we got the fish nymphos and the ending from Mortal Kombat Annihilation. Exactly! You can't make that kind of stuff up! Someone did. Into the Wild Green Yonder, the fourth movie, might have had something. Maybe a tiny snippet of Game Players of Titan, but it felt more like a Stephen Baxter or Arthur C. Clarke story that they never wrote. So let's leave the movies. Instead, let's jump into an episode that's an unapologetic spoof of Dick's work. But there's more that you missed. Law and the Oracle is the story where Fry joins pre-crime. That works pretty much exactly as in Minority Report. Whether it's the C Steven Spielberg adaptation or the original story. But that's not enough. After Fry goes through the same plotline as Tom Cruise did, trying to save Bender from being captured during a liquor heist, it was all a hoax from inside the pre-crime. The Oracle bot wanted all this to happen so he could consume the liquor that will destroy his ability to see into the future. <sighs> oh, finally! Blissful ignorance! 
I have no idea what's going to happen next. A gun fires and hits a person the bullet wasn't intended for. The world Jones made was an early novel of Dick's that has way too much blood to go through now. But its ending is what's relevant here. It involves a man named Jones. He can see a year into the future. Because of this, he has become the most powerful man on the planet at this point. When threatening him, an attacker tries to shoot Jones's bodyguard. But Jones jumps to the bullet's way, killing himself. Why? Because his life has been awful. He has hated experiencing everything twice. Seeing the future has made him despise himself and the predictable world. Or in other words... Do you have any idea what a burden it is to know everything that will ever happen? To never be surprised? To know the punchline of every joke hours in advance? So yeah, Minority Report episode has the ending of The World Jones Made. It's an amazing book. For years, Terry Gilliam has wanted to adapt it into a movie. I might have spoiled the ending for you, but let's stay real. That movie will never be made, because it would be too awesome. Before reaching the series finale, which main concept is from a PKD novel, because of course it is, let's run through a lightning round of maybes. I'm a one man with only minor obsession. The bibliography of Philip K. Dick includes 44 novels and 121 short stories. So of course I haven't gone through all of them. And no, there was no way I could get through exegesis. No one can. If you read it, you lie. Maybe there's a bit of Scanner Darkly in Hell is Other Robots or the Butter Junk effect, but I can't say for sure. Farnsworth Paradox is about parallel universes, but so are half of Dick's story, so I can't pin down if there's something specific. Except the spray. Wasteland of LA in The Cryonic Woman resembles one time of Doctor Futurity a lot. Even more than it does Doctor Blood Money or Deus Irae. Leela's message in the late Philip J. Fry also seems like it might have been inspired by Dr. Futurity. In Leela and the Genes talk, where Fry and Leela reenact Octavia Butler's Xenogenesis backwards, there is a literal man in a high castle. This means nothing. I just wanted to say that I was dumb enough to think it might, because I postponed reading the damn thing for so long. The Deep South is the episode where the crew goes to underwater Atlanta. It might have elements from the galactic pot healer, but I can't say for sure. And what's up with all the president's heads? Really, I have no clue. This next is likely just a coincidence, but I want to mention it because I couldn't keep a straight face while reading it. In Our Friends from Frolix 8, a class system is created, and the Earth is ruled by the new men and the unusuals. Humans with all sorts of abilities, and normal humans, old men, are second-class citizens. This leads to a rebellion, where the normal humans are very much on the losing side. That's until those puny humans get help from an alien who helps them to overcome their oppressors. Alien called Morgo. A being that stands between total enslavement of humans is Morgo. Morbo can't understand his teleprompter. He forgot how you say that letter that looks like a man with a hat. It's a T. It goes T. Hello, little man. I will destroy you! Maybe I should mention Fun on a Bun just for including the Eternal Sunshine plotline since Charlie Kaufman's work might be the only media affected more by Phil's output than Futurama. Fry falls off zoo train. <laughs> he thought he recognized one of the monkeys. What was I crying about? My point was, whatever I forgot, let me know. Tell me what I missed. I'm way too deep in this rabbit hole to keep digging myself. Which brings us to the final episode. Meanwhile, 
is the episode of where Farnsworth creates a device that sets the universe back for 10 seconds. Friends, I found a ten dollars. Ten dollars, you say? Let me see. It fell off a man. The man got into a taxi, but the money did not. Friends, I found a ten dollars. You found some money? Show me. Uh... Say, check out the money I found. It fell off a chump. <laughs> During a suicide attempt, Fry manages to break it and the whole universe stops. Everything except Fry and Leela. When everything else stands still, they make most of the situation. They grow old together. Decades pass until Farnsworth finds them and fixes his device. Fry and Leela can now spend another lifetime together. You mean we'll all get to live our lives over again? Oh my, yes. Even that nasty robot, what's his name? Of course, we won't remember anything that's happened. What do you say? Wanna go around again? I do. Three Stigmata of Palmer Eldritch is a novel from 1964. Many of them were. It was a crazy year. The Earth is almost unhabitable. People are drafted to terraforming Mars that, that is just as merciless of a desert as you might expect. To keep themselves sane, people eat a drug called candy. It takes them to an alternative reality where they share experiences of perky pat. Can D gets a competitor, Chu Z, brought from Proxima system by a man named Palmer Eldridge, who arrives by crash landing to Pluto. A man characterized by his robotic eyes, arm and teeth. It's rumored that Chu Z is a Proximan hallucinogen that could get the world addicted to it in a way that would end in the Proximans taking over the solar system. What makes Chu C so great is that people can now go to realities of their own choosing instead of sharing the one they have no control over. This sharing during a candy trip really is like people not lining up but just proceeding as a group to the being John Malkovich experience. Yeah, that sounds like an accurate comparison. While the Martian pioneers spend their time in these alternative realities, time doesn't pass outside. But that effect is limited when eating candy. One can spend a year on a Chu Z trip and wake up on Mars, where they can continue the terraforming from where they left. There is no limit for how long you can make your Chu Z trips to last. Strangeness ensues. Those who consume the drug find themselves in realities where polymer is always present. And the effect doesn't wear off. Eventually the essence of polymer comes through the dream and the characters realize they themselves have the stigmas of the robotic arm, eyes and teeth. There's a lot more, but that covers the basics. But the point was that the best thing the Martian colonists got was the ability to live on their own while the outside world stood still. Make their own world, just like Fry and Leela. Sure, Inception had come out a year prior, but let's face it, that movie wouldn't exist without Ubik or Three Stigmata. Neither would these. When the writers thought the series might be over way earlier, they made what could have been the last episode to be this delightful blend of the last question and next slash the golden man. I'm processing so fast it's like I can anticipate that the ceiling fan's gonna fall and knock Zoidberg unconscious. Wrong, Mr. Genius. Not that ceiling fan. Oh! All right, I kinda glanced over that. Anyway, the Golden Man was a Dick's short story where we follow a man with a golden skin who can see into the future. This was later very loosely adapted to Next, 
where Nick Cage searches for a bomb and survives silly action scenes thanks to his precog abilities. Instead of stopping terrorists, how would Bender use similar powers? There's no time now! <gasps> Quick! Zoidberg! Take three steps to your right! Oh! <laughs> it's a small thing, but I can't overlook it completely. Back to the last episode. So I'd say that if Inception was the only concept to build an episode around, that wouldn't have been made to be the series finale. This is a great ending because it encapsulates perfectly why this marriage of old science fiction writer and 20th century cartoon was so successful. Dick's stories were about concepts and ideas that boggled the mind. When it came to creating compelling characters or protagonists with relatable problems, that was more of a hit and miss. But incorporating this to Futurama, a series where we learn to care about these unique individuals, the end result managed to make us feel in ways that might have been impossible for any other media. Futurama's longevity helped in this. Few seasons in and we will inevitably know the motives and desires of the characters, even if they don't say anything. I am Washbucket. I love you. Washbucket has always loved you. Dick's novels or short stories didn't have this continuity. Unlike the dunes and the foundations, every story established its own world with its own rules and characters. And sometimes those stories only had time to make half-hearted effort to achieving that. While fixing this, Futurama will remain the pinnacle of Philip's legacy. It's a piece of cultural history that could have stood on its own just fine. But a continuous stream of inside jokes and easter eggs by math nerds and sci-fi enthusiasts that comprised the writing crew created something that was much more human than the sum of its parts. Thank you for reaching the end of this video. I respect your patience. If you want deeper analysis about obscure science fiction, there's my channel that I basically just started because I just learned to edit.